thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to speak and, and also to stay here for a while. It's been a, it's been a lovely month. Okay, so everything for the theorem I'll, I'll present today is um, joint work with Sung Jin Oh and um, Saurabh Shashani. And it's part of a, a project that we've been working on for a few years now, and I'll present um, the latest uh, uh, result that we have. Um, so the, the topic is, is wave maps, and in particular wave maps on, on hyperbolic space. So I'll start by just introducing the wave map equation. Um, so wave maps uh, concern maps u from a Lorentzian manifold m with a Lorentzian metric eta, um, taking values and a Ramanian manifold n with metric g. And in this talk, <coughs> uh, we'll let m take the product form. So it'll, it'll, it'll be of the form r cross sigma, where sigma is a Ramanian manifold. And um, as I mentioned, we'll focus on the case sigma equals hd. And we'll also talk a bit about the case sigma is d-dimensional Euclidean space. OK, so wave maps are, are formal um, critical points of a Lagrangian action. So L of u is 1 half integral over m, du, du, the ball on m. And so this is a very natural action. It's nothing other than the Lorentzian um, analog of the Dirichlet energy for the harmonic map equation, for example. Um, and here in coordinates, so it's, it's take, for example, Tx coordinates on on m and coordinates um, uj on the target, um, then this can be this uh, this is expressed as follows. So this is equal to um, eight alpha beta um, tx uh, g ij of u uh, d alpha ui d beta uj, and then the volume form is square root of the determinant of eta, um, dtbx. Okay, so this is the action. And critical points um, satisfy the following Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, d alpha, d alpha u is equal to zero. Okay, in the, in the talk I'll um, use a convention that I'll be, I'm summing over repeated indices. And I'll also s stick with the convention that the Greek indices are for our space-time indices on, on m. And I'll use Roman um, letters, so i, j, k for um, indices on the target. OK, so here, this is the wave map equation. Um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful equation written like this. It doesn't, it's hard to understand what exactly is going on here. But the nonlinear structure is encoded in this uh, capital D, which is um, the pullback covariant derivative on the pullback bundle u star t n. OK, so um, this is still quite abstract. Um, in the case when n, uh, I'm going to run out of chalk here, n is embedded, um, isometrically embedded into um, Rn, then, um, then this equation takes the form the d'Alembertian on m of u is perpendicular to the tangent space of u, I'm sorry, of n over the point u. And this can then um, be simplified as follows. So the, the d'Alembertian of u um, is equal to um, s of u d alpha u d alpha u, where s is the second fundamental form of the embedding. So this is a nonlinear wave equation where the, um, the nonlinearity arises from the geometry of the target manifold. I mean, it's quadratic in the derivatives of u. OK, so we'll, we'll study the Cauchy problem, which means that we'll give ourselves initial data. Um, u, ut of u, where initial data, um, so u0 is a map from sigma into n. So I'll take a smooth map, say, um, into n. And u1 um, at each point x and sigma, so u1 is a, is a map into the tangent space, um, is an element of t u0 of x n. So this is 
uh, initial data set for the wave map problem. Okay, let me, let me just uh, uh, start by just uh, stating our theorem, and then I'll talk a bit about um, the proof, or rather more, more like the formulation of the, of the problem, um, how, to, how to formulate the, the, the problem correctly in order to prove it. Okay, so the main theorem for today is that in the case, um, so sigma is HD, so d-dimensional hyperbolic space, and d is bigger than or equal to 4, so if you have high enough dimensions, then um, there exists an epsilon bigger than zero, such that for every smooth um, initial data set, u not u1, and let's also assume for simplicity that, uh, let's say, u not is, um, uh, is equal to a constant u not of x. Um, outside a compact set. So it takes smooth, compactly supported data. In the case of the map, this means it's a constant map outside of a, co outside of a compact set um, with small um, critical norm. So, so, so U not U1 measured in the sole bluff space, HD over 2 cross HD over 2 minus 1. It's less than epsilon. So for any such data, um, there exists a unique, smooth, global in time um, solution, u of t. And moreover, we can say um, uh, that uh, the same norm of u of t, so the soup in t and our u of t dt u of t, This stays um, around the size epsilon. And more of it, we have the following qualitative um, uh, estimate on, on the asymptotic behavior of, of u. So u of t minus u infinity, and measured in L infinity in space, um, <laughs> converges to 0 as t goes to plus or minus infinity. OK, so we also can prove a bit more. In particular, um, uh, we have a more precise statement on the asymptotic behavior, namely that of scattering. Um, but it's difficult to formulate scattering. At this, at this point, I need to introduce um, the notion of a gauge first. So we, have a, we, have, we also prove scattering, um, but this an appropriate gauge. Uh, yeah, this is, sorry, this is a constant map. So this is, this is a measure in L infinity. So, ye so yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's given by the initial data. Oh, okay. so, this, so the solution converges to a constant, just to a point on, on, on the target as, as t goes to infinity. What's n? Sorry, what's n? Ah, an n. The the target is um, no n is uh, just a, a, a nice uh, Riemannian manifold, say of bounded geometry. So including say hyperbolic space, the sphere, um, nice. Yeah, yeah. N is a nice Riemannian manifold. So here, uh, this is a, and this uh, this is a small data result. So and for for large data, then then the dynamics, the wave map equation depends. Um, the, a lot on the target, um, but here this is a small data problem. So here this is this is for any any target. Okay. So let me make a few remarks. So and so one, this is um, s a small data critical theory um, for the wave map problem. And why do I say critical? So in what sense this is critical? I don't have a s scaling invariance, but in the case um, sigma equals R D. Uh, then um, h dot d over 2 plus h dot d over 2 minus 1 is invariant, is a unique um, Sobolev space. So the norm here is invariant under the scaling of the equation. Under the scaling. Ah, thank you. Uh, so if u is a solution, then so is u lambda t of x, which is u of lambda t lambda x. And so this is the analog of a, of a small data scaling critical uh, global result. OK. Um, and I'll say more about this, this, uh, this problem in Euclidean space in a minute. Um, so just a couple of remarks. Why, why are we doing this? So, um, so, so why, why HD? 
Well, one, it's just a, it's a natural starting point to study um, a geometric wave equation on a curved background. It's a, it's a nice, uh, it's a constant sectional curvature um, geometry. And, well, we have a head start in that there's, well, this is the linear theory on HD, so, so the linear theory has been well studied. So for, um, so solutions to this equation have been well studied in particular. Um, so you have nice strict arts estimates. So there's nice dispersive theory. And so they're global strict arts estimates um, uh, prove for the free equation on, on hyperbolic space. And this is, um, I'm not going to write all the um, citations on the board just for the sake of time, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few. Um, there's, for the Schrodinger equation, there's work by UNESCO and Staffolani and Valeria Banica. Um, and then for the wave equation on hyperbolic space, uh, we rely on the strict arts estimates of Metcalf and Taylor and um, Anker and Pierre Felice. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so I'm still trying to answer this question, why HD? Um, and then second, why um, high dimensions? Well, okay, again, this is starting in high dimensions this is an easier problem because we have better dispersion in higher dimensions. The wave map problem becomes quite difficult um, outside of symmetry in dimensions two um, and three. Okay, two is the most interesting, um, interesting dimension because you see when d equals two, uh, the critical Sobolev norm is the energy space, so it's H1 cross L2. So what we're really interested is in studying this problem in, um, in the energy space when d equals two. Um, but we're starting with this theory um, in high dimensions to develop some technique needed to um, address the low dimensional case. Um, okay, so, so d equals four is easier, it's a starting point. And, okay, so now maybe I'll get to this question of why. Well, in, um, is we've taken a, a look at the energy critical case, but under a symmetry reduction. So, um, so um, with, the, with my um, colleagues, we've studied the um, cr energy critical case under um, co-rotational symmetry. And, um, so what does this mean? So, particularly we, we looked at maps from R cross H2 taking values in either S2 or H2. So in two different um, two-dimensional uh, rotationally symmetric targets and co-rotational symmetry means that the map respects the action of rotation on both the domain and the target. And in this case, we saw um, qualitatively different behavior than one sees in the Euclidean problem. Um, so I won't talk too much about this today, but ma many of you have seen one of us uh, talk about these, um, some of these works um, in the past. But what we found interesting is that, so even in the case, so for the H2 target, um, in the two-dimensional case under co-rotational symmetry, there exists um, many um, finite energy um, harmonic maps. And, and these play an interesting role in the dynamics. So um, they're all um, asymptotically stable. And um, in particular, so not just asymptotically stable, but they're globally, asympt asympt globally asymptotically stable. So meaning you have um, stable soliton resolution. Um, in in the, the case of the H2 target. So you can look at the initial data um, and there's a geometric population of the initial data that you can identify that tells you which um, harmonic map you scatter to. Okay, so this is in stark contrast to the Euclidean case where um, it's well known, say from the 60s, even the work of, the work of Eel Sampson, that there are no um, finite energy um, harmonic maps from R2 into a manifold of uh, negative sectional curvature. Okay, the, um, the, the case of the S2 target is perhaps even more interesting. There is again um, a continuous family of harmonic maps and these display some interesting um, uh, stability properties that I, I won't get into today, but it relates to the uh, um, talk of uh, Mikhail on uh, Monday, meaning that one sees in fact uh, anonymously sl slow decay. So there you have stable harmonic maps, but one sees anonymously slow decay to these harmonic maps. So um, arbitrarily slow decay rates. So both of these problems we thought were interesting and our goal in studying uh, the wave map problem outside of symmetry is to try to um, then study 
non uh, co-rotational perturbations of these har harmonic maps. So to study the, the full theory, um, and okay, and that there's there's of course then many more finite energy harmonic maps once we leave symmetry as well. Okay, so let me um, leave this aside, uh, just as some motivation, and now talk a bit about how to prove this theorem. Um, so first, why is it um, difficult? This is a semi-linear problem, um, and I have small, uh, smooth, compactly supported data. Well, um, the main difficulty um, lies in the, like we have a quadratic derivative nonlinearity, okay? And, um, and it's well known that, um, that this is non-perturbative, meaning that you can't um, close an iteration argument um, based solely on estimates for, for box. Okay, so, so, in, and so in fact, one, one, one can't just close using semi-linear semi techniques. And this was a uh, difficult, for in the case uh, when sigma is rd, this, uh, this small data problem attracted quite a lot of research over the um, interest over the 90s and early 2000s. Um, there was fundamental work by uh, Kleinerman and Makadon and Kleinerman and Selberg for the sharp uh, subcritical local opposeness theory. And then uh, the there was breakthrough work of Tataru, um, and then followed by Tao in the around 2001, who proved the analog of this theorem um, in the case when sigma is rd and when the target manifold is the sphere. Okay, and this was followed then by, by uh, work of Kleinerman and Ronyansky, um, who established the, the same theorem for more general targets. And um, and then uh, Joachim Krieger um, uh, as well for the for the case of the of hyperbolic target. Okay, so let me let me and, and uh, we'll get to a bit more of the history in a minute, but let me just say what was Tao's key insight. So the the key insight of of Tao was that um, maybe I'll just say this was that because uh, I'll get into it in a second um, on the board was that the uh, the gauge structure of the wave map equation um, can be used to renormalize away the non perturbative part of the nonlinearity. So he performed a gauge, uh, a gauge transform, which made, which rendered this quadratic, the, or at least the worst part of this quadratic derivative interaction, um, perturbative, um, amenable to perturbative analysis. Okay, and this idea of using uh, gauge structure um, ar uh, arose in the um, harmonic map literature in the work of Hiller on, on, on 2D harmonic maps, regularity of 2D harmonic maps. Okay, um, but then, uh, so there's this breakthrough work of Tau. So this is the case. Um, in is SD, <coughs> and then there was a deep simpl simplification of this of the of the uh, the tau theory, the Taro tau theory, in high dimensions, um, due to uh, Shatta Struve and Namhad Stefan Stefanov and Ulenbeck um, in around 2000, um, 2002. There was this flurry of work in the early 2000s, and in particular, I'm going to focus on the work of Shatta and Struve, um, as it's their general approach to apply here. So what Shatan Struve realized was that um, you could perform a, uh, so this is some of deep simplification, one can perform a global um, gauge transform and, um, and they, so they, 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 they found a, a nice gauge transform which uh, uh, in, in particular they, they formulated the derivative formulation um, in the Coulomb gauge. So I'll explain this in a second. Um, but what they saw is that after, if you put yourself in the Coulomb gauge, the whole nonlinearity um, uh, is, is essentially becomes uh, cubic or higher and hence amenable to perturbative analysis. So let me, um, uh, so this is roughly the approach we'll use. Um, however, we'll see that the Coulomb gauge is in fact um, very poorly suited to the case of a curved uh, background domain, and we'll have to resort to a, to, to a different technique, but we'll roughly follow their approach. So let me outline how this goes. Okay, so Shatan Struve work in the derivative formulation, which means that, um, so they work with, the idea is to work with uh, du um, instead of u, and du is a, um, is a one form over m uh, with values and u star taking values in the pullback bundle. And it has the nice advantage of being linear. It's a one form, it's a, it's a section of this bundle. Um, so this is a linear object. 
And um, their idea, uh, the idea is to um, choose, formulate the problem in terms of du. Um, but the first step is to choose a uh, global frame field um, E, collection of n tangent vectors varying smoothly on u star tn, which is a vector bundle over m. Okay, so um, why does such an object, why does such a, you have a global orthonormal um, uh, frame exists? Because, okay, so the, the, the base is uh, contractible manifold in our case. So it's R cross HD, so the base is contractible, so you always have at least one such frame. Okay, so choose a global frame field, and then the choice of E gives rise to a connection form A. So in particular, the connection, um, the covariant derivative on U star Tn um, can be expressed in terms of this connection, um, of this uh, connection one form A as follows, A alpha, where here this is the levi shavita connection on the, on the base manifold M. So this, this is extends naturally to tensors, the tensor bundle, um, taking val tensors taking values in this, in this bundle. Okay, um, and so this, this again appears in the, in the formulation of the wave map problem. And now we'll express du in this frame. So, um, so write, so find um, one form psi such that um, du is e psi. So maybe write this e j psi j. And um, the component, we'll write the components of, of du as um, uh, with lowercase psi. So d, d alpha u is e psi alpha. <coughs> okay, so now the wave map problem um, becomes the following div curl system. So, uh, so u will wave map translates now in this psi formulation to d alpha psi alpha is equal to zero. And then we have the following torsion free property of our connection. So this is, a, this is our curl relation, d alpha psi beta minus d beta psi alpha is equal to zero. So the wave map problem becomes this diff curl system. And what about this connection form A? Well, this satisfies, uh, so A satisfies uh, a, a curl type formula. So um, let me write this as like this. Um, let me write this as A, B. Um, a, B. F, um, B alpha. So where F, B alpha, where F is the, um, the curvature two form on the pullback bundle. And since this is the pullback, pullback curvature, this is nothing other than the Riemannian <laughs> curvature tensor <coughs> on the target N um, at psi B psi alpha. So this is the fact that this is the pullback on, on, on the curvature bundle on, on N. So A satisfies this equation, but is otherwise underdetermined. Okay, so we have some freedom here, and our freedom amounts to the ch uh, choice of E, which then determines A. And so Shatas Juve make a particular choice. They, they require A to be um, divergence-free. So D B spatially divergence-free equals zero, and this is called the Coulomb condition. Okay, so this is the Shata Struve framework for, for the wave map equation and also the, the similar framework used by um, uh, Namhad Ulumbek and, and Stefanov. I should say that this actually goes back to the Chang Shata and Ulumbek. Chang? The Chang, Chang Shata and Ulumbek on the Schrodinger maps. That's <coughs> oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, my, 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 uh, I was attributing it to Hiller and the harmonic map uh, yeah, formulation. But in, the, in the first time that they wrote it, like was, uh, was in the Schrodinger map. Okay, sorry, I was on. to Ullenbeck's paper. I mean. Sure, sure, no, of course. Uh, yeah, so, so I was going to mention um, the Ullenbeck paper from the early 80s, which shows you can always, in a small data setting, you can always, the question, we have to solve this divergence equation or to find such a, such a frame. And this is, this is always be done in a small data se um, setting with a fundamental paper of Ullenbeck from 82, I think. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so this is the column gauge setup, and uh, what? Where do we go from here? I'm sorry for the. Uh, 
Okay, so here we just now we'll just differentiate these um, these equations, and we obtain an elliptic equation for a and a wave equation for psi. Um, so we differentiate, and we obtain the following elliptic equation for a, a alpha. Um, we have a curvature term, a beta um, equals. And the following um, nonlinear wave equation for psi. Psi alpha. Psi um, beta is equal to, um, so excuse me for a second, let me write all these indices down. Um, psi alpha uh, psi beta Okay, um, all right, this is a, a complicated looking equation, but in the case sigma is rd, it simplifies quite nicely because these are curvature terms, so these are zero in the case of the domain manifold is flat. And uh, I won't write this all out again, but the left-hand side simply becomes the Laplacian of the components of A. So, component, so A is a one form, but for each component, we have the scalar Laplacian of A is equal to um, the right-hand side. I won't write this all out, R of u. Psi b, psi alpha, and um, the scalar um, d'Alembertian of psi alpha is um, so we have the following coupled system of an elliptic equation for a and a nonlinear wave equation for psi, and now Shatan Struve um, uh, uh, analyze uh, this system. Um, using LP estimates for, uh, so standard elliptic theory um, estimates for A, and then Strickert's estimates for this wave equation. And in particular, they prove control over, um, they prove a priori estimates, L2D, um, of a controlling norm uh, for, uh, for, this, for Psi, and then they're able to close their small data um, uh, argument. Okay. So this is very nice. It's a very simple, very simple argument um, to prove the small data theory for, for wave maps, at least uh, simple in, in with today's uh, uh, at, at this so point. Ah, so where does it, so so the dimension s comes in uh, uh, handling this term. So in high enough dimensions, uh, uh, you can so you have to look where 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 can we how do we analyze this term? So the right hand side, let's say um, in. Um, so the right-hand side needs to go in uh, L1t, L2x, say, in, in dimension 4, for example. And we have no choice but to put this term uh, now in, um, in energy type norm. So in L infinity in, in time and uh, in L2 in, in x, because we control one. This is, this is in dimension 4. This is h2. And so we control one, one, two derivatives of u, which is one derivative of psi. So, so this, this should go in L2. But that means we have to put a in uh, L um, in L one and T, and um, and L infinity and X, okay, and and, and this is this is this is the, the, the um, so the, the point is is that is that we have no choice but to always put this in L infinity and T, and then in lower dimensions we can't control A um, in in L one and T. We can't we have a failure of integrability, and so you need to rely on more sophisticated structure on the right hand side. Namely, there's null structure apparent here, which one relies on in lower dimensions. It's a very delicate analysis. And these simple spaces uh, as well aren't, um, uh, based on strict arts estimates, aren't, aren't quite enough to close. So in high dimensions, though, this we barely, um, at dimension four is a threshold for which a simple argument on strict arts estimates work. And it's because of this, this difficult term here. OK. Um, sorry. Uh, all right. OK, so how about extending this now to the setting of a curved background? Well, OK, this now we're in trouble because we have these curvature terms here. Um, and so the left-hand side doesn't reduce to a nice scalar um, elliptic equation or wave equation. Um, and uh, and so what, what are these left-hand sides? They're, they're, they're again, they're nice objects. This you can, you can see is the Hodge 
um, Laplacian of the one form A, and this is the Hodge del inversion of the one form Psi, but these are tensor equations, and there are no um, good estimates known for, for, uh, for these objects. So in particular, there's no global Strickert estimates known for the Hodge um, del inversion um, on, on acting on one forms. And in fact, in the case of hyperbolic space, it's known that the Hodge Laplacian behaves poorly on one forms. In fact, there's a failure of boundedness of the Riesz transform. Okay, so there's, ba there's bad elliptic theory and just unknown um, dispersive theory in this case. Okay, so, we've so how the, the main question becomes, or one initial question becomes, is how do, how do we formulate this problem correctly in the case of a curved background? In particular, how do we deal with the issue of tensoriality on the, on the left-hand side for the main dynamic variable? So the main dynamic variable in this case is our, our A alpha and Psi alpha. And the answer um, um, comes, uh, there's a, a nice way to get around this if we use um, Tau's caloric gauge which was introduced in a, in a different context, but, but miraculously deals with this issue of tensorality um, beautifully. So how does Tau's caloric gauge work? Um, uh, <coughs> so let me actually formulate the question. So the issue is find um, framework um, that deals with one, the tensorality, of main dynamic equations, and two, um, still the point of this whole thing was to renormalize a nonlinearity to make this amenable to perturbative analysis. Here, sorry, I, I didn't say enough about this, but um, but you see that in this case, um, a uh, uh, we saw this elliptic equation in a, meaning if you basically write a as um, as gradient inverse, so it's Laplacian inverse of Gradient. This is a nice curvature term. Our, our target is a bound that has bounded geometry, so this is like Laplacian of psi squared, for example. So a is that a can be expressed nicely in terms of inverse derivative of psi squared, and so we see here in the nonlinearity that we have the nonlinearity becomes essentially cubic in, in psi. Okay, so so how do we deal with the tensorality and also um, suitably renormalize? Okay, and so uh, Tau's caloric gauge will do both of these uh, things for us. So how, do, how does this work? Um, it's a really beautiful um, idea, and, and uh, it's, it's kind of miraculous, um, miraculously simple. So we choose, uh, so the, wrong slide. So it'll be, it's based on the harmonic map heat flow um, uh, for, for our wave map U. So we start with, so start with, where our goal is to prove a priori estimates like, like these. So start with a smooth wave map um, U of Tx. And we'll use this init as initial data, so on a, on a time interval I. And we'll use this in as initial data for the harmonic map heat flow. So we'll solve, um, we'll introduce a new time variable S and solve ds minus Laplacian U is S of U, DKU, DKU, and our initial data at time S equals zero is U, TX. So for each time T, we solve the harmonic map heat flow. So under mild bootstrap assumptions, um, the heat flow is well behaved in this, in this small data setting. And in particular, it converges to the same <coughs> constant map um, for each t and x as s goes to infinity. Okay, so now we have, <coughs> where should I go here? Uh, oh, I can put all this up, I guess. Ah. Okay, so it converges, the heat flow under this nice bootstrap assumptions converges to a fixed point um, as s goes to infinity for each t and x. Um, and now um, we're gonna, Choose a, so now the next step is to choose a dynamic frame, um, E on U star Tn, which is now um, sits over, well, let's put HD here to be precise, sits over, we have a new, we've introduced a new time variable S, so it sits over here. And there's a canonical choice for this frame at s equals infinity. Since we converge to a constant map, we simply choose the same set of orthonormal vectors 
um, over each point t and x uh, in the domain at s equals infinity. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we choose a dynamic frame E and a connection form A. So E is a function of s, t and x, and A is a function of s, t and x. Um, and we require that E s dx converges to the same fixed frame as s goes to infinity. And, um, and then our second requirement, and this is Tau's caloric gauge, these are Tau's caloric gauge conditions, is that the frame be um, parallel in s. So we require that ds of e is equal to zero, which is the same as requiring that a s equals zero. So these are the caloric gauge conditions. And I'll, I'll try to motivate um, both of these choices in, in, in a second. Um, but we'll, I'll first I'll write down our, our candidate for our new dynamic variable. Um, so we'll express our map uh, u in this frame. So write, as before, except we now have, we also have ds of u, is um, e psi s. So we'll find such a psi s. And then again, still d alpha of u is e psi alpha. And our candidate for the main dynamic variable will be psi s. Okay, which is now, this sits over, so we'll see that this is manifestly um, scalar, or it satisfies the scalar question. So we we'll want to show now that if we just work with psi s, we um, satisfy both of those two questions. So we can suitably norm renormalize a nonlinearity, and also we deal with tensorality of the main equations. Yes. Yes, it's all the same u infinity. Yeah, so this is fixed by the data and by our bootstrap assumptions. Yeah, um, so just a, we bootstrap. Uh, we, so we assume that the map converges to u infinity um, for all t and x on this interval. Okay. Uh, all right. So why is this? Um, why is this a natural choice for the dynamic variable? Um, let me try to motivate this with a really simple example, namely that of the linear um, heat flow on Euclidean space um, used as littlewood paley theory. So. So analogy, there's a, with a linear heat flow. Uh, so given a function f naught, we can solve the heat equation with this as data. Um, and the solution to the heat equation, so f of s is nothing other than um, convolution with a Gaussian. Right, in the case of this is sigma is rd, here for a second. On the Fourier side is e to the minus s c squared. F naught, and this is a Gaussian adapted to um, the ball um, a frequency c less than um, s to the minus 1 half. So the Gaussian adapted to this ball in frequency space. And so this damps the, the high frequencies of the, of the function f. Okay, to damp the low frequencies, so low frequencies, so damp the low frequencies, we can multiply by s times Laplacian. So we'll define little Pelli projection onto um, frequencies comparable to s to the minus one half by damping the low frequencies with this this operator, and then e to the s Laplacian s f naught, which is s times Laplacian of f of s. And which is nothing other than, um, since f <coughs> solves the heat equation, this is just s ds of f. Um, so this is our this this damps low frequencies, this damps high frequencies, and this is roughly like projection onto frequencies like s to the minus one half. And one can in fact prove all the nice things about little Paley theory, including the square function estimate um, in this framework on Euclidean space. So in particular, um, and what's nice is that we can recover f um, from this little Paley resolution just by integrating, by integration. <laughs> so this is ds um, over s. And this is our little Paley projection. OK, so, the, the, um, so here, little Paley projection onto frequencies s to minus 1 half is given by the s derivative of our, of our initial function, of our function. And so we'll make this analogy here. So we'll use the Littlewood, the 
harmonic map heat flow resolution of our map U as a uh, um, geometric um, analog of Littlewood Paley of the Littlewood Paley via heat flow. So this is um, this is our candidate for main dynamic variable, and we say it's a ge geometric um, or it's a nonlinear Littlewood Paley decomposition of our map U. Okay, so let's let's just briefly um, show how this resolves the the remaining issues. And we, of course, need this um, analog of this reconstruction formula, which is where precisely where Tau's caloric gauge conditions enter. So, um, so right, U S T X converges to a fixed U infinity, and E S T X converges to a fixed frame E infinity as S goes to infinity. And so one can see that all the other derivative components, so psi alpha, STX and along with the connection form, these then are forced to converge to zero as S goes to infinity. <laughs> and moreover, we have this caloric gauge condition, so DS, so AS is equal to zero, is the same thing as DS is just partial S. And again, this now this means for A that the curvature, if we have S in any one of the components here, SF alpha, this remember, um, involves derivatives of A in the commutator of A with itself. So this just, this, the only one that remains is ds A alpha. Okay, so we can write psi alpha of S is the integral, minus the integral from S to infinity, just by the fundamental theorem of calculus, ds psi alpha, ds prime, which is now using this caloric gauge condition, integral from S to infinity, um, capital D, so this is the, um, which is then, and now we use torsion-free property, so this is nothing other than d alpha psi s. So we can, we can recover the, all these derivatives, the psi alphas from psi s, derivatives of psi s, and the same with the a's. So a alpha s is um, d s a minus this integral of f s, uh, sorry, alpha, which is now the pullback curvature psi s psi alpha. And so we see again A is now quadratic in um, psi s and psi alpha. And we can, since we can recover psi alpha from psi s, we can now recover all the A alphas from just psi s alone as well. Um, and then finally, the uh, finally the um, the equation for psi s is we'll see a scalar nonlinear wave equation. Equation. So if we just take d alpha, d alpha of psi s, <coughs> we can commute these two. This is d alpha, d s psi alpha. And now we commute, we pull the s derivatives out. Um, remember, this is just ds, but we introduce a curvature term. So this is ds of d alpha psi alpha, and then plus um, the curvature arising from these two. This is f alpha s psi alpha. And I'll call this w. So this is a scalar now. d alpha psi alpha is, is a scalar. Um, this, oh, let me, let me uh, let me just, uh, okay, and we can expand this, this, uh, this left-hand side. So this is just the component psi s. So this first guy acts like, this is like d alpha plus a alpha times, now this is now um, a tensor, but now it would actually act on like this. So this becomes the scalar d'Alembertian of psi s is equal to dsw, so this term, plus f alpha s, alpha and what we get by expanding this product here. So this is minus 2a alpha um, d alpha psi s um, minus a alpha a alpha psi s minus um, nabla alpha a alpha psi s. Okay, so this becomes the main dynamic equation. Um, 
that we'll then estimate using strict, this is now a scalar equation, we can estimate this using strict arts estimates um, for the scalar Laplacian, um, scalar Dell inversion on hyperbolic space. And let me speak a bit about this nonlinear structure here. So what's W? W is, um, is D alpha psi alpha, and this is at zero, so, um, so this is, remember this is the wave map equation, so this, this should be zero. Um, but it's only zero at s equals zero, um, because we have to, otherwise we've, we're commuting the wave map, the harmonic map, heat flow, and wave map equation don't commute. So w restricted to s equals zero, since we come from a wave map, this is equal to zero. And it satisfies, um, w can show satisfies a um, covariant heat equation, which we solve from s equals, from s equals um, zero to s. So this is, this is at, this is at um, heat time. Oh, this equation occurs at heat time s. So we have an equation for each s. Um, so solve on zero to s. And remember, with our analogy to the um, to the um, linear heat flow, this is the the s time between zero and s. This is like the high frequency part of uh, of the function f. Okay. So w w knows the high frequencies of the initial map u. So it arises from the high frequencies. Um, and then the rest of the nonlinearity, um, these other four terms, involve just the frequencies at S and, and lower. So, uh, so, so in particular, so this involves frequencies um, S prime bigger than or equal to S, which are the low frequency part of our, our solution, our, wave, our initial map U. And we see this in these equations here. So A, when we see psi alpha and A alpha, this involve integrals of psi s from s to infinity. So this is, this is like, uh, this, is, this is the nonlinear structure that arises from the low frequency component of the map itself. Okay, so this is a, this, um, so one can, okay, so this is kind of where the analysis now starts. So we need to study this equation and, and prove, prove estimates. Uh, let me just remark that the, um, in the initial Schatta-Struve approach, I said, where is this, uh, the crucial, bit about A is that we have, we use elliptic theory to estimate A. And this is the same in the Namhan stefanov ullenbeck approach. You use elliptic theory to estimate A. Um, what's the replacement for that? Well, it's nothing other than the regularity theory for the harmonic map heat flow in this case. So we recover A and psi alpha just by integration, just by a fundamental theorem here. But we use regularity theory for the, for the parabolic equation, which is a scalar, scalar parabolic equation, to prove estimates, um, the suitable estimates that allow us to estimate A in terms of psi s. Um, and psi alpha in terms of psi s. Uh, a couple other um, last remarks. So one, just some advertisement for the caloric gauge is that this is, we can see this is like nicely, um, so all of this will work in the 2D setting as well. Um, in, in fact, uh, the 2D setting that I, I laid out earlier, um, because it just relies on understanding the harmonic map heat flow, which is a well-studied equation. So in particular, it works nicely in, in large data settings as long as you have a handle on the harmonic map heat flow. And in, in the cases where you want to study the wave map equation, um, you do have such a, such, a, such a nice understanding. So it works well in large data setting where, where the Coulomb gauge is a little bit of a disaster once you, once, you, once you leave the small data setting. You have very, a lot of difficulty with this elliptic equation. Um, here, um, in particular, there's quadratic interactions of A which then become relevant, uh, which I didn't even write down here. Um, which they're, they're perturbative in the small data setting, but they become prob very problematic in the large data setting. So the caloric gauge is nice in large data settings. Um, and the last um, remark, my last minute, is that the worst part of the nonlinearity, so it also is, is better in the, in, the, in the worst interactions in the nonlinearity. <laughs> so here I said that A was roughly, in the Coulomb gauge setting, A is roughly like inverse derivative of psi squared, at least in the small data setting. And here, the, the worst interaction, you have, you have a dangerous high, high to low interaction. So you have high, high um, in inputs with a low output, and then they're hit with an inverse derivative. So this becomes dangerous in the Coulomb gauge, and this interaction just doesn't appear um, in the Coulomb gauge setting. So, it, so in fact, the, um, this appears in our analysis in a, in a subtle way. But um, it's very important, becomes very important in the, um, in the low data setting, and it was very important in particular in work on Schrodinger maps by um, uh, Bejanaro. Uh, UNESCO, Koenig, and Totaro. I hope I get the names in order right. Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks.
questions so I didn't understand what depends on the source being the hyperbolic space in what you said ah so the so n not much um, in what I said here but um, the crucial fact is that uh, at some point we're now we're going to start analyzing this equation and we use Strickert's estimates um, for the D'Alembertian hyperbolic space. And so if you have a different uh, geometry, so none, none of this relied in particular on hyperbolic geometry, what I talked about today, but then if you want to start doing proving estimates, um, uh, you, you need something like this. So. so is it true that if you have good Strickert's estimates? Then this, then this works, yeah. So it means that if, for instance, take uh, sigma to be the Euclidean space with uh, asymptotically flat metric, yes. you should have the same result. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, in particular, I, I, yeah, I, this is part of my thesis. I did something like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's all right. This is a long time ago. Long time.